and then you can start whenever. Presuming that we are live, um, can videos be turned on for me and after struggle? Yes, you should, should be able to turn on your video. It's saying that it's unable to start video. When I That's on. the same thing for me, Stefan. So okay. try it now. Please. Try now. Okay. okay, David as well. I'm good. Okay, I'm, I'm um, all right. I see Mr. Presidente there. Okay, um, perfect. Um, well, it is. A great pleasure. This is a true honor and a pleasure to be never thought the day would come when I um, would be introducing President David Spurgle. Um, so hi, I'm Stefan Alexander. I'm the 20, I am the president of the National Society of Black Physicists. This is our very first um, plenary talk, and it's a it's you know a great honor. So I just want to quickly introduce our speaker, um, Dr. David Spurgle, the president of the Simons Foundation. Um, David, um, as I just said, is the president of the Simons Foundation and the Charles Young Professor of Astronomy Emeritus at Princeton University. Um, his contribution to helping to establish the standard model of cosmology and measure the age, shape, and comp composition of the universe has been recognized with the Breakthrough Prize in Physics, the Shaw Prize, the American Physical Society Heinemann Prize, and membership in the National Academy of Sciences. David has also been a pro the primary mentor for over 35 doctoral students, including um, NSBP members such as Neil Tyson, as well as Ollie Petters and myself, and is one of the founders of the NSBP Simons Foundation Scholars Program, which is its second year, very successful program. And you will be seeing some of these scholars um, give um, talks on their scientific research. His mentorship work has been recognized by the NSBP um, Mentoring Award of Excellence, and the Princeton University Presidential Distinguished Scholar Award. Um, on a side note, um, David, you know, um, you know, he has really been one of the uh, champions of NSBP, um, and you know, and also I just want to add that, you know, the success that we've seen um, over the last two years, I would just say, like, if we had to point a finger at a major one of the major contributors, it's actually David Spurgle and his in, his um, investment in NSBP. The final thing is that um, he's an avid bike rider, um, and now he, he started painting back in the days, and now he is picking it up again. So on that note, um, President David Spurgle, it's all yours. Thanks, Stefan. So, uh, you know, like most things you watch on uh, your computer screen, I'm going to start with a short advertisement. Um, for the NSB student talks, we had a terrific group of students this past summer. Um, and uh, they'll be talking on Friday between 4 and 5.30. And uh, I think you all will be, if you can join us for that talk, those talks really impressed by the, you know, the students, the work they did. Um, I think you look at those, that group, and you're seeing a piece of the future of physics uh, when you, you look at the students there. Um, as Stefan mentioned, uh, we, we've been supporters of this summer program. It's now a joint program between the Simons Foundation and NSPP. We started this in 2020. Uh, and of course, uh, we all remember that summer. And uh, we, at that point, could only operate remotely. Uh, summer 21, we were able to be almost all uh, in person. And uh, we started out uh, with the program really focused and entirely in computational astrophysics. Uh, we started to expand into some of the other areas in which the foundation supports computational work, uh, co including computational biology and neuroscience and uh, quantum materials. And our plans for, to continue my advertisement uh, for summer 22, is to expand this program even more and uh, support researchers, uh, students who are doing research with uh, in areas that the foundation supports in uh, 
across computational sciences and with the Simons Observatory and in, in some of our other projects. So that uh, we think there'll be significant opportunities there. Um, I think if you hear from the students on Friday, you'll see there's a, a terrific uh, group of students who I, I think had a great time in New York um, and uh, encourage uh, those of you who are uh, undergraduates to think about uh, applying for the program in uh, for summer 22 and those of you who are mentoring undergraduates whether you're faculty or graduate students or undergrads yourself to uh, encourage them to apply and we'll announce the details on the applications uh, through the NSBP so you you know uh, read all your NSBP email and we, we will be uh, I'm part of that in the, the coming months describing that. Um, so after that advertisement, um, I thought I'd turn to talk about uh, some of the science I've been working on um, really over my career. I mean, in many ways, these questions are ones that are uh, have fascinated me for a long time and describe uh, where we are and what we learned. And, uh, you know, then, um, open that up to uh, questions and, um, you know, questioning, you know, one of the many problems with Zoom is it's sort of hard to multitask as a, a speaker and see questions in real time. Um, so, you know, I do have the chat window open. If there are things that, uh, you know, uh, I guess, are we doing chat or, or Q&A? Yeah, your, your, your questions will be moderated by one of our NSBP, um student council member, Nico Cooper. Who, oh, he's a Princeton alum like you. Hey, Nico. It's, well, good not, to, I can't quite see you since your camera's off, but good to have you on. And um, yeah, do you want people sending questions in chat or in q and I believe yeah. that Nico will get the questions and he will pause them and, and get them to you and moderate yeah. it that way. Yeah, in the, in, in the chat would be good. Excellent, excellent, okay. So let me now share my screen. Does that work? Yes. Excellent. Okay. So let me talk to you all about um, measuring the shape of space. And uh, as you'll see, as we get into this talk, I mean two things by shape. I mean geometry. What is the local curvature? And topology, what is the large scale structure of space? Topology, we can really think about as a question is the universe infinite or is it finite? Or can we see evidence that we live in a finite universe? And that, that's, that's how I think about the question of topology of the universe. And in this talk, what I want to do is begin by introducing some of the key concepts that go into our basic cosmology, talk about the microwave background, and then uh, introduce the ideas in geometry and topology and then, then apply them to think about the shape of the universe. Mind everyone when we start as cosmologists, basically special relativity means that to be a cosmologist is to be a historian. When we look out in space, we look back in time. You know, if you've seen the movie, The Martian, you know that when we talk to someone on Mars, there's this 30 minute delay. They did a great job showing that. And, you know, it's, it takes time for the signal to get back and forth. You see things on Mars as they were, depends where it is in its orbit, but say 30 minutes ago. You look at a nearby star, you're not observing that star as it is now, but as it was four years ago. You look at the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest big galaxy to us, we see it as it was a million years ago. The further out you go in space, the further back you go in time. You look at a galaxy that you might observe, say, in the Hubble telescope, you're seeing galaxies that might be a billion years old looking back 
You look out 5 billion light years, you're looking at things that are 5 billion years ago. And uh, the talk today will focus on the microwave background, the leftover heat from the Big Bang. And uh, when we look at the microwave background, we're looking at the universe when it was about 13.8 billion years ago. And as I'll discuss, the image that we look at when we look at the observe the leftover heat from the microwave background is we're seeing the universe about 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So when we, oh, somehow it's all came up, all right. Uh, then go to think about cosmology, the next key ingredient is general relativity. General relativity consists of two key ideas. Mass tells space how to curve. As you can see in the right, there's the sun curving space around it. And light and space tells light and matter how to move. And you can see first the classical 1919 eclipse experiment effect where a star behind the sun, as it's at position A, its light gets deflected by curvature of space. And there the star appears instead of at position A, but at position B. And uh, that shift in position was what Einstein predicted. And here's the New York Times headline announcing light all askew in the heavens. You know, men of science, at that time it was mostly men, you know, though they are forgetting some leading figures like Marie Curie was around then making some key contributions, you know, more or less agog over results of eclipse observations. I love that phrase, more or less agog. Anyway, they claim that stars were not where they seem to be or calculated to be, but no one need worry. The great triumph, of course, is the stars was exactly where Einstein predicted them to be. And this was the first great triumph of general relativity, a theory that has held up remarkably well over the past hundred years it has gone through a whole series of tests. I think the most recent significant one are, are all associated with the detection of gravitational waves from merging black holes and from merging neutron stars that let us see that the you know, gravitational waves move at the speed of light, gravitational waves exist and are emitted in the way that general relativity predicts. The properties of the black holes seem to be consistent with the observations. Um, so you know, general relativity has been remarkably successful I mean, we can test it, and that gives us confidence to apply it in cosmology. When we apply general relativity in cosmology, we end up assuming the universe is homogeneous, which is consistent with observations, with a model in which we live in the expanding universe. And that's the you know, Freeman, Freeman Robertson Walker model, rhetoric of this expanding universe. And the picture I have of the expanding universe is I think of suppressing one dimension. So I think of our galaxy as one of many on the surface of a two-dimensional surface. And let's, this picture, it's easiest to think of it as a two-dimensional sphere. And as the universe expands, the distance between galaxies grow and grow. If we go back in time, the universe gets denser and denser and denser. As we extrapolate back to t0, the density of the universe becomes infinite in what we call the initial singularity or more colloquially the moment of the Big Bang. And I wanna stress that that's a moment. It's a moment in time, not a position in space. You'll notice as the universe, we go back in time, the universe gets denser and denser, things get closer and closer together. And uh, there's no special place on this sphere. The whole sphere collapses down to a point at the initial singularity. Well, now let's, instead of go, uh, going back, let's now run things forward. We know that we see this leftover heat from the Big Bang, the microwave background. It's today at a temperature of about three degrees above absolute zero. 
that microwave background radiation fills all space. So if we see today that it's hot and at three degrees, as we go back in time, it gets oops, hotter and hotter, denser and denser, so that at the we get closer to the Big Bang, we start out with a universe that is remarkably hot, very dense. That hot, dense universe is filled with a plasma, electrons, positrons, quarks, mat nearly equal amounts of matter and antimatter. That hot plasma expands. Uh, eventually, the most of the electrons and positrons annihilate. The quarks come together to form protons. So if we look at the universe about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, it is a dense plasma of protons and electrons and radiation. About 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe gets cold enough that the photons no longer can ionize hydrogen and the electrons and protons are able to combine and form hydrogen. And most of the um, atoms in the universe at that point um, are e combined to make either hydrogen or helium, about 24% of the mass of the universe at that point in helium, the rest basically in hydrogen. Then the universe becomes transparent to radiation because at that point, the radiation, which is in the uh, infrared, can propagate freely. It doesn't get absorbed or scatter or all, because there's no more free electrons. And then the microwave background then uh, propagates directly to us. Thus, when we look at the microwave background, we're looking back in time to that moment when, uh, when electrons and protons first combine to make hydrogen. So the fact that we're, we can look back there, observe the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, meant that we could learn a tremendous amount by studying the microwave background. That's what motivated us now almost 25 years ago to propose to NASA to build a satellite to map the microwave background at high resolution. And this is something that we did together with a team of scientists at Princeton and NASA Goddard and uh, that uh, worked together to uh, map the microwave sky. So these are our maps. Um, we'll talk about what they mean in a moment, but I now wanna to turn to what actual observations look like. So this is the sky around us. Um, and uh, you see, when you look at this image, variations in temperature, the red regions are regions that are about one ten thousandths of a degree hotter than the blue regions. This red band across the center that you see is our emission not from the early universe, but from our own galaxy, the Milky Way. I think of this as looking out the window on a sunny day. And as I look through the window, I see some smudges from the dirty window. And that red stuff, our galaxy, it, that's what you're seeing is primarily dust in our own galaxy, smudges as it were, that, that blocks some of our view. And you can see that red region at this frequency of 22 gigahertz blocks our view of that blue and green pattern in the back, blue, green, and red pattern, which is tiny fluctuations in the microwave background. What we do is we make those measurements at multiple frequencies. This is a, a bit higher frequency, higher still, yet higher still at our highest frequency. When you're looking at that map, you're looking at a sphere around us. Here's another representation of that same image. You can see that we look at towards either the North or South Galactic Poles that we see mostly emission from the early universe. These flu tiny fluctuations in temperature. This is what our observational data really looks like. And again, as you wanna think about this, this is, a sphere, this is the sky around us, so we see it as a sphere. One of the first things we wanna do in our analyses is combine the data together so that we can look at a map that's uh, corrected for foregrounds. And this is a picture here 
of what I like to think about as the universe's baby picture. You can think of this picture as tracing tiny fluctuations in the density and temperature of the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang as we're looking out around us. And uh, this pattern statistically can be characterized remarkably simply. So we're looking at this picture. We actually have a order a million independent points. The subsequent experiment, the Planck experiment that I'll talk about a bit later briefly, uh, has now measurements on 10 million points. And it, the universe turns out to be ridiculously simple. Its basic properties are that it's a Gaussian random field uh, with a power law correlation function. So that means with two numbers, and amplitude and how the fluctuations vary with scale. I could completely describe the statistical properties of this map. There seems to be no other information. But one of our surprises when we looked at this data was when we looked closely, we found what looks like two letters, SH. And uh, whether this represents the early universe telling us something about Stephen Hawking or Saddam Hussein, um, I don't know. I think it's mostly telling us that humans are really good at finding patterns. And if I show you a pattern of random noise, your eyes will find something that looks interesting. Um, the amusing thing about that SH is I first noticed this sitting next to my colleague Lyman Page who helped design much of the experiment as we were listening to a talk given by Stephen Hawking. And uh, he showed our data behind him. And uh, we thought his students had put the letters in as a joke. And then when we looked at our data, we realized there really is an S and what looks like an S and an H. Um, though, if we changed our color scheme a bit, it would tend to disappear. I do think this is telling us about our eyes finding patterns. But more importantly, this really represents um, a picture of our early universe. So how do we analyze this data? Well, if it's a Gaussian random field, what we want to do is measure the variance in that field and marry it, measure as a function of scale. So you can think of what we do is basically throwing down circles, looking at the variance circle by circle, and looking at that as a function of scale. Um, Formally, what we do is a bit different. Uh, we take the map, we expand it in spherical harmonics and look at the spherical harmonic amplitude versus scale, but uh, it's functionally equivalent. Here's some more maps. This is going to higher resolution. As I mentioned, the Planck experiment, which was launched 10 years later, mapped the sky at much higher resolution. Today, we have an experiment in Chile. I think if you hear from some of the NSBP students, you'll hear some projects associated with this where we're mapping the microwave sky at even higher resolution. Uh, the upper panel shows maps measured from Chile with the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And the takeaway I wanted you to have from these pictures is that we were actually mapping the sky with many different instruments varying resolutions, and one of the great experimental accomplishments is that these independent experiments, if they operate at the same frequency, they see the same sky. And you might think at first, of course they should, it's the same sky. But if you've worked as an experimentalist or worked as an observer, you know that it is always very reassuring when independent techniques get, you know, trying to do something very precise, get the same answers. And before we even get to the theoretical implications of the results, I just want to emphasize this, the um, triumph of my experimental colleagues in making these sensitive, precise measurements. Um, the picture in the bottom right is of the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And you can see looking behind it, the incredibly beautiful location in the Chilean Andes where this telescope is located. It's uh, at a height of about 17,000 feet above sea level. So uh, it's certainly uh, not only a scientific adventure operating there, but even a physical object. 
adventure getting up to that site. So the let me turn from the observations now to the mathematics. What do we want to learn from some of these observations? One of the things we want to learn is the question, what is the universe's geometry? What do I mean when I talk about the geometry of the universe? Well, in general relativity, geometry is determined by the density of the universe. Remember we said that matter curves space, so the denser the universe is, the larger the positive curvature. So a, po a very dense universe is positively curved. A low density universe is negatively curved. A flat, uh, a universe whose density is just at the critical value, so we call flat. And in general relativity, geometry is destiny. So if the universe is positively curved, it's dense enough that gravity will eventually overcome expansion. It will reach a maximum size, then turn around and collapse. So that if we were to live in a positive density universe, what lies in our future is the hot big crunch as expansion reverses and the universe collapses to ever higher densities, eventually collapsing in a hot death. If the universe is negatively curved or flat, and this is aided by the presence of dark energy, then the universe will expand forever, becoming less and less dense, colder and colder. So you can see that since the geometry is linked to both our fate and the composition of the universe, it's a very interesting thing to be able to measure. Now there's a couple ways of measuring the geometry of the universe. One which we'll use with the microwave background is to look at angles. You can see that the sum of the angles in a triangle in a flat universe is 180 degrees. The geometry that we were taught, you know, middle school, junior high school, whatever, uh, is not, not only valid in your, you know, eighth grade or whatever geometry class, but it's also valid on the scale of the universe. The sum of the angles of a triangle is uh, 180 degrees. Things are negatively curved. The sum of the angle of a triangle is less than 180 degrees. And if it's positively curved, it's greater than 180 degrees. Why is this relevant for the microwave background? Because the microwave background basically is Turn to that later. Oops, go back. Is gives us a characteristic ruler. So it, we know the characteristic size of those fluctuations. They're basically set by how far light can travel in 380,000 years. So, nature, when we look at the pattern of hot and cold spots that we see in this picture, the characteristic size of those hot and cold spots are 380,000 light years. So I know the length, I measure the angle, I, can deter I know the distance that's set by the age of the universe, I can determine its geometry. So what we would expect if there wasn't dark energy and we lived in a negatively curved universe is the characteristic size of the hot and cold spots are about 0.2 degrees. If as we see, our universe is very close to flat. And we say that because the characteristic size of the universe is about a degree. We also probe the geometry by looking at how light falls off. The way that works can be thought of by thinking about properties of circles. In flat space, the circumference of a circle is 2 pi r. As my make the radius of a circle bigger and bigger, the circumference grows, grows linearly. Also, that's how spheres behave. As I make my, the radius of a sphere bigger and bigger, its surface area grows as four pi r squared. That's why this, because the area grows as four pi r squared. When I look at light from the sun, the further I get away from the sun, light falls off as one over r squared because energy is conserved. So by measuring, oops, 
how light falls off, we can infer the geometry of the universe. Now, this is how things work in flat space. In positively curved space, things get more interesting. Now you take a sphere, so you draw circles on a globe, and as you march away from the North Pole, think of the, radi the circumference of your circle grows and grows until you get to the equator. And that's the maximum circumference you have at the equator. As you go further south, your circumference gets smaller and smaller. In fact, the circumference of a circle as you move around on the sphere, goes as two pi r e times sine r over r e in the limit of small r just goes looks like flat space so right near the pole things look flat but as you move away you'll notice there's a maximum size and similarly to the circumference going that way the area of a circle of a sphere in a, a positively curved space goes as sine squared so we have a different luminosity law that we can measure. And these are techniques that let us distinguish by looking at the way light falls off and for the microwave background by measuring its geometry, whether space is open, flat, or positively curved or closed. And here's our geometry picture that I've mentioned already. We expect that the characteristic angle of fluctuations should be about 0.2 degrees in an open universe without any other matter in it and uh, close to a degree in a flat universe. So what do we see when we look at the, these observations? We go and we analyze them. And here's one way of doing the analysis. This approach is more pictorial rather than making a plot. I'll turn to the plot, but it's nice, I think, to get physical intuition from this. We take this picture, we take every hot spot in the map, we center the map around each hot spot and stack the map. We repeat that with each cold spot and we look at the pattern both of temperature and polarization. And that's what's shown with the Planck data here. Let's start on the left. You can see the stack data around a cold spot. And you see if you stack the data around a cold spot, there's a characteristic hot ring that's about a degree across. That degree size is set by the fact that we live in flat space. And if you look at how far a sound wave can move in the 380,000 years, that sound wave represents the, uh, the, the radius of that red ring. And you can take the, all the hot spots on the map and stack them. And you find on average around every hot spot is a cold ring. And we can do the same thing with the polarization pattern. And we find a characteristic radius for the pattern of polarization and the pattern of temperature. And that characteristic size of those rings give us a measure, it's like nature holding up a ruler for us, of the geometry of the universe. And if you look at the lower panels here, the lower panels are theoretical calculations of what the pattern should look like if the universe was flat and had the composition in terms of matter and dark energy that we think it does. So all of these data point to the universe being flat. Here's another way of representing the data. This is the way we actually present it. This is looking at plotted on the, these axes are spherical harmonic amplitude versus multiple moment multiple moment represents really angular size. So uh, about the angle associated with the multiple moment is approximately 180 degrees divided by L. You'll notice that this curve peaks at a scale of about a, L of 180, and that corresponds to a scale of about a degree. And this is another way of representing here in spheral harmonics, what you see in this picture that there's a characteristic scale of a degree that's really set by how far a sound wave moves. Now the red curve here, which is our theoretical fit, is uh, this represents our initial data. You'll see more modern data in a moment. And what you see is a fit with 
five basic parameters that seem to describe our universe. Those five basic parameters are the universe's age, about 13.7 billion years, its composition, about 4% atoms, 23% dark matter, the rest dark energy, and a model in which uh, scale invariant fluctuations grew uh, to see the growth of galaxies. Oops. Over time, our data is improved. Oops. And uh, oh, I didn't put on the more modern data. More modern data looks good. The, the theory curves go right through the modern data points. And uh, I can probably pull some up in questions if we have time. I could slip those slides to the back. So now let me turn from the geometry of the universe to the question of topology or the shape of the universe. And uh, to do that, I need to now teach you a little bit about topology. Topology is the overall shape of the universe. And I think about topology by just starting out with a square. And you see this, oops, square here. And what I can do with this square is I can identify the top of the square with the bottom. That's equivalent to taking this piece of paper and saying, if I come off this end, I reappear here, or equivalently taking it and taping it together so that if I'm an ant crawling around this surface, I just keep coming around. That's a two-dimensional surface. Um, this is, uh, take the surface here. You can glue this side to this side and you get a donut. And if you're an ant moving along a donut, you live on the surface of what is a finite space. You keep walking around that donut, no matter where you are, you, stay, you can cross it lots of times, you're staying on that donut surface. When we talk about the topology of the universe, it's really a three-dimensional generalization of this two-dimensional surface where I take a cube and I glue the sides together. And we're basically asking, asking are we living in a three torus? Are we living in a three-dimensional donut? Now, this work I'm talking about, a lot of this was done in collaboration with my then postdoc, now longtime faculty member at Montana State, Neil Cornish. And after Neil left Princeton, he went to Cambridge, where he was a postdoc with Stephen Hawking. Hawking at the time was being filmed for an episode of The Simpsons. And some of you may, who are Simpsons fans may have remembered uh, some episodes with Hawking. While the film crew was filming Hawking, they talked with Neil about his research. And Neil described this work on three tori and how we were looking to see if the universe is donut shaped. The Simpsons writers fell in love with this. And uh, if you watch the appropriate episode, you can watch Homer Simpson um, advocate, talk about his research on the idea that the universe is a donut. And, uh, you know, Stefan in the introduction mentioned uh, some of my academic honors, but uh, I really feel my greatest honor is to have my ideas represented by Homer Simpson and effectively be played by Homer Simpson in, a, in what is a form of science documentary in The Simpsons. Anyway, back to topology. Another way of representing topology, and I think this is quite useful as a visualization technique because we talk about things, talk about the science, is we can also represent our donut um, as a tiling of space. So rather than just gluing these sides together, I make identical copies of the same universe, the same square, and I tile them together. And you can tile space here in two dimensions and think about this tiling going out to infinity where these are just identical copies of the same universe. And as you move from one square to another, you're moving across tilings. Now, while I talked about tiling space with squares and making it into donuts, you can actually make it in more complicated spaces. You can tile space 
with hexagons if space is hyperbolic, and then you end up creating a tiling that has looks like this um, pretzel with two holes, and there are many more complicated tilings. As I mentioned, we can generate generalize our tiling of squares or our donut topology to uh, three dimensions where it's a three torus. And here's a representation of tiling space with a three torus. And there are lots of different ways of tiling space. Here's a tiling that works in hyperbolic space with different sides identified to each other. And there's a visualization of that tiling of three space. You can not only tile negatively curved spaces, you can tile positively curved spaces. And here's a tiling of positively curved spaces that, uh, with spheres. Here's another tiling with the decahedrons. Looks like tiling space with soccer balls. So there's lots of different ways to tile space. Now, what happens with the microwave background in a finite universe? When you're looking at the microwave background, you're looking at a sphere around us. Right? You're looking out in space, back in time. You look at everything that is 13.87 billion light years away from us, or 8 billion light years away from us. That's a sphere around us. Now, remember in our tiling representation of topology, you think of identical copies of the universe. So to go back to this picture here, these are identical copies of the earth, just a representation. Those are all the earth, that's always us. So each of those identical copies see a sphere around us. So what happens if we, when you do that? When you have a pair of spheres, those two spheres intersect in a circle. What does that mean? That means as I look out in space, I look in that direction, there's a circle in that direction that I can draw and a circle in that direction that I can draw that's at that surface 13.8 billion years ago since space is finite. That's the, I can get to that point by going that way or by going that way. So I should see the same pattern in the sky in that direction as I do in that direction. And regardless of what the underlying topology is, Whenever I have two spheres intersect, they also in, always intersect in circles. So by identifying those circles, I could see the sign of topology. And uh, those circles are the underlying uh, generators of the underlying topology. So if I can find them, I can determine the topology of the universe. And here's an example with three tori where you can see all the different match circles that I would expect to find if I lived in a finite universe whose size was smaller than the 13.8 billion light years. So we've got this microwave background map. And what we wanna do is look at that map, look for these intersecting spheres, look for this tiling and uh, this, Represent, first picture shows a representation of what we would expect to see in a finite universe. This is S max, what's plot on this axis, is what we would should, the, a measurement of what's the best match between any circle on this side and any circle on this side where alpha is the radius of the circle measured in degrees. And you could see that we'd expect to see on characteristic sizes associated with going around the universe a finite number, you know, once or twice or three times, um, circles of different sizes that match up. And this black curve represents what we should see as our best match as a function of angle of all possible circles. The blue curve represents the blessed match that we'd expect to see randomly. So in an infinite universe or a very big universe, the universe should follow a blue curve. In a finite universe, it ought to follow the black curve. So what do we, what do we see in the data? Well, before we tell you that, let me tell you about what I first saw in the data. And to do that, I have to go back in time until when I analyze this data for the first time. 
So at that moment, I was looking at the first measurements we made, these first observations of the microwave on sky. Um, and, you know, our data has improved a lot over the last 18 years. But when we were looking at that first data, I was uh, working harder than I ever did in my life. We were knew we had a limited time to do our analysis. I also had three small children, including an infant. I would wake up at night, be waking up at night, but woken up at night by my uh, youngest. I'd go, I'd work at the computer for a while, I'd go back to sleep. And uh, in the midst of this, I was running this analysis where I was taking these simulated skies I'm showing in this figure, testing the code to make sure it reproduces the results. And then for the first time, I ran the code on the real data. And I saw a pattern that looks basically identical to what I'm showing in this plot. And I got incredibly excited. I felt I had discovered that we lived in a finite universe. Now, you might be scratching your head at this point and thinking, I never remember learning that we lived in a finite universe. And that's because what I had done in my sleepless night was take the simulated data and write it over on my, and give it the same file name as the real data. And I overwrote the data on my laptop. And uh, this did not prevent me from sending off very excited emails to all of my collaborators that we had discovered topology. I then went to sleep, like hardly sleep, I was just so excited. Woke up in the morning, went, checked it, was still there, went to email it to my colleague, Gary Hinshaw, who then wrote back and was incredibly excited about this result and said, can you send me the original data? And I went to look at the original data and it didn't look like the map we had and realized I had overwritten the file. And, uh, you know, so I did have the excitement for about 14 hours of thinking I discovered the universe was finite. When we went to look at the real data, it looked like that blue line. So the red represents circles going around this way and this way. Black, you flip it, one represents taking the cube and gluing the sides together identically. The other is rotate that side by, rotate it by 180 degrees. No matter how we orient the circles, we don't find matches. We conclude from that, that we live in a big universe. And over the past few years, this has been extended. Now we're turning to observations, not by the WMAP satellite, but by its successor, the European Space Agency Planck satellite that not only made a precise measurement of temperature and higher resolution else, but also measured polarization. And this shows in these plots, the pattern of polarized light that it sees in the sky. And you can not only look for these match circles in the temperature maps, but also in the polarization maps, our Planck colleagues did that. And this is their version with, uh, from their 2015 paper of what happens looking at different forms of the Planck data. And on the left, you see what's predicted. On the right, you, you see what's observed. And you can see that we don't see what's predicted in a finite universe. And we now have even better limits on the geometry and topology of the universe. All this points to a universe whose geometry is flat and is very big. So we've learned we live in a big flat universe. So what should you take away from this? Well, certainly that we live in a big flat universe, but I think more generally that cosmology is really in a golden age that questions which at one point seemed as purely philosophical questions. Is the universe, how big is the universe? How old is the universe? Is the universe finite? Um, what is its shape? What is its composition? These 
fundamental questions are now questions that we have addressed observationally and have been able to come up with pretty detailed quantitative answers. Now, on one hand, while our data has shown a universe that's remarkably simple, a universe that's flat geometry, no signs of topology, uh, characterized by five basic numbers, its age, the density of atoms, the density of matter, how lumpy it is and how it varies with scale. Five numbers fit basically all of our cosmology. Um, that um, universe is very strange. Atoms make up only about 4% of the universe. Most of the matter in the universe is in the form of dark matter. We don't know what dark matter is. There's a range of exciting ideas on what it might be. Uh, Stefan, our host, is one of the people who's been at the forefront of developing creative ideas on what dark matter might be. Even stranger, there is energy associated with empty space. Could be vacuum energy, energy associated with the vacuum could be in the form of energy associated with some uniform scalar field. There's a number of, there are many interesting ideas on what the nature of this dark energy is. It's the dominant form of the universe. We don't know what it is. So we're in a, we're in a situation that's both half empty and half full. We've learned a great deal, but we've got these deep profound mysteries in cosmology about the, you know, what is most of the universe made of? We don't know that. You know, what's effectively, what's the dark energy? What's the dark matter? Well, I've told the story that starts with this Big Bang. We don't understand the origin of the Big Bang. If, if indeed these fluctuations are driven by inflation, you know, what is the physics of inflation? What was there before the Big Bang? All these questions almost certainly require new advances in fundamental physics. And, uh, I think that this area of cosmology remains one of the most exciting areas of physics. And I'll you know, end with an advertisement uh, targeted at the undergraduates and graduate students that as you think about things to explore, to encourage you to think about exploring um, cosmology, because I think it's going to be, you know, there are these deep questions like what's the dark matter and the dark energy, and it's gonna be people like you that are going to be the ones that in the coming decades will uh, answer these questions, uh, either through advances in theory or advances in observation or experiment. And I think most likely a combined strategy that will uh, let us understand these profound questions. So let me stop there and uh, thank you all for listening and uh, have time to take questions and talk. So I'm going to stop sharing and uh, turn back to Nico and uh, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks so much, David. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, there's a few people behind me because we got the executive board and the student council of NSBP uh, all here at the, uh, the NSBP headquarters. Uh, so yes, I'm Nico Cooper. I'm a part of the NSBP student council. Um, so just for a little bit of our plug on Saturday at 1 p.m., we're going to be talking about the NSPP Student Council and what we do and what we're planning on doing and hopefully trying to gather up some people interested in being on the Student Council. Uh, but right now, uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully this talk made up for uh, me staying in my own little world in, uh, in the physics department at Princeton and not really taking any astro courses. Uh, but I'm going to be moderating some questions that we have in the chat. Uh, let me try to get up to the first one. Uh, yes. So from Greg Severn, uh, dear Dr. Spurgle, thanks so much for this fan for this fascinating talk. Could you give us your view of the many worlds interpretation? And I'll add in my own little bit here too. I'm also curious if there's some sort of intersection with the many worlds interpretation and uh, observational signatures of. Uh, of the CMB. So, you know, um, I've never worked professionally on interpretations of quantum mechanics. Let me just remind people that uh, 
quantum mechanics is also one of these things that's both very successful and very strange. We know how to do lots of detailed calculations in quantum mechanics. Every time we use it to calculate something, you know, for the last hundred years, right, quantum mechanics starts in the 1920s, it's been giving us the right answers. For the last hundred years, we don't understand how do we interpret the wave function. And in particular, how do we interpret the role of observation? In the Copenhagen hypothesis, the way to interpret the wave function is that when you make an observation, the way it's a classical thing that causes the wave function to collapse. One of the objections to the Copenhagen philosophy uh, approach is it treats us as classical observers as not subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. And in terms of our interpretation, now all these interpretations, you get the same thing when you do a calculation, but when you go to understand the calculation, you, you get come to different points. In the many worlds hypothesis, um, every time you make an observation, the universe bifurcates into two possible universes, one in which you've observed something spin up, another with you observe something spin down. So every observation causes the universe to bifurcate. When I think about that as a cosmologist, that means someone in a distant galaxy is causing the universe to bifurcate. And um, as that bifurcation happens, somehow I need to know about it over here. Or like I should bifurcate, you know, a causally that happens. So personally, I don't like the many worlds hypothesis at all. I think it's the wrong way to think about quantum mechanics. What's the right way? I've always had a soft spot for some inter an interesting approach that was developed by Bohm and de Broglie. And, you know, one of the things that Bells and Pauli articulate. Yay! Stefan, you're a Bohm de Broglie guy too? Yes, I am, big time. And for very good reasons too. Excellent. So, is that you can't. Quantum mechanics means the universe cannot be, you can't have local causal physics and have the universe be deterministic. What Bohm and de Broglie emphasized is that there's a way of thinking about quantum mechanics where you abandon, instead of abandoning determinism and think about things probabilistically, you say, I'm going to stick with determinism and give up locality. So if you could have allow, and they've formulated a non-local approach, um, we don't have a good relativistic version of it, but you know this non-local approach, um, I think has a lot of nice intellectual features. One of the many things that I would have liked to have done in my life but haven't is figure out a way to develop an understanding of cosmology that was embedded in Brom de Broglie. And, uh, you know, I, there's been some work on this, but I think there's a lot more to do. David, this, inspired by you, inspired by you, you um, this, there's a group of NSBP theorists that's working on that problem as we speak, inspired by you. Yeah, and I, I'm, I think it's really, you know, um, <laughs> This is a long way of getting to the fact that these different interpretations are at the moment all philosophical differences. They're not predicted observational differences. So I would distinguish these many worlds way of thinking about things, which are talking about the wave function from um, this topological models I've talked about, which, at the, which make distinct observational predictions. Thank you so much. Uh, I think, yeah, our next question uh, from William Ratcliffe. So what's the current experimental situation given dark energy, CMBR, lensing events, et cetera? Is the universe open or closed? Or does right it, now does it's sitting right answer? on the balance, right? Yeah. So it's the best value is, so we characterize this by a, a value we call omega, where omega greater than one is a 
closed universe, omega less than one is a, a, a negatively curved universe. The best value we have is basically 1.0 plus or minus about 0.01. So, you know, it's the observational uncertainties are such that we can't tell the answer, right? It's, it's our data continues to improve and the best fit value remains within one sigma of one. So Williams says that's the theorist answer, but this is actually the uh, uh, observational answer. Uh, and he asked, does it keep me up at night? That observations roughly agree with the theory. No, what keeps me up at night is my dog has been waking me up to take him out to the bathroom at 3 a.m. That's what that's what's uh, kept me up the last couple of nights. I need to get his schedule better. But yeah, I during the day, I do think about this question. And I think about this more broadly in terms of this. Um, well, what, if you haven't read this wonderful article by Eugene Wigner on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, like stop listening to this talk, download it, read that. It's like the best thing I've ever read in physics. And um, that says like, for reasons we don't understand, the universe, math works wonderfully. The universe is just beautiful and simple. And that's been the strange thing in fundamental physics. And it just, the, sim the simplicity and the elegance of the universe is something we don't know why it's that way. And I think this is just another case of the universe being um, as often as simple as it can be. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and I think for our final question from Latoya Anderson, uh, given the improvements made to telescopes over the last few decades, what new questions would you like to study or you think will be answered in your lifetime? So, um, the next steps in this is we're building telescopes with higher resolution and higher sensitivity. I'll note that um, for those of you interested in astronomy, the National Academy earlier today just issued the decadal survey, which is a prioritization of what, do, what are the next big things we do in astronomy. One of the things they identified in that is uh, sort of the next generation CMB experiment called CMBS4, an elegant name, stage four CMB experiment is what it stands for. And that's going to represent uh, uh, you know, mapping the sky at much higher resolution than Planck, looking for gravitational waves in the early universe in the microwave background with increased sensitivities. So I think the questions I'd like to see answered, well, it, you know, uh, you know, did inflation occur? What's the physics of inflation? What's um, the composition of the universe? What is the dark matter? What's the dark energy? All those questions are ones I'm hoping to see answers to. The one that I'm pretty confident we'll actually get an answer to because it just, in a sense, we know what we need to do to measure it requires a factor for you improvement in sensitivity. And that's understanding, um, you know, what are the properties of the neutrinos and de uh, detecting and measuring the density of neutrinos. So those are, uh, you know, what we hope to get at. All right, and we have two more questions actually that were just added. Uh, another from William Radcliffe at NIST. Uh, how, much of a uh, how much of a constraint on different models of quantum gravity does your data provide? Um, and sort of model dependent, um, you know, the, fact that we see fluctuations or these Gaussian random phase fluctuations, they look a lot like what they are. They're very consistent with, with what you predict for uh, quantum fluctuations in the vacuum 
that grow to form the galaxy fluctuations we see. So it's consistent with kind of a, a first quantum, you know, uh, a, the first step in quantizing gravity is you take sort of perturbation theory and you quantize gravitational waves into gravitons. So just sort of linear fluctuate at linear order, sort of second quantization. And that gives you a consistent story that's consistent with observations. Now, most theories that I know of quantum gravity at that kind of first order all look the same. They all look like, let's take gravitational waves and treat them like photons and get gravitons. And right, so we're consistent at that level with what you expect in terms of properties of the fluctuation while we evolve. Um, so, yeah. And um, then I see Anthony's question, mm. uh, Anthony Hodge, on uh, the quark U on plasma. Yeah, so there's a couple answers to that question. So one of the things that we really like to, um, that the properties the microwave background are sensitive to when you look at the fluctuations is the composition of the universe, the number of effective degrees of freedom as the universe expands. So um, that changes a lot of the quark gluon plasma phase transition. So we're actually sensitive to if there's some new stuff out there. The other thing that we're sensitive to um, somewhat through the microwave background, but also through some other observations and a bunch of interesting work on this, is whether the quark gluon phase transition is a first order phase transition or a second order phase transition. My understanding, and I'm not expert, you probably know more about this than I do, is that the current calculations point to second order or relatively smooth. But if it's first order, you can think about it like, you know, water forming ice, you can have all kinds of um, either defects produced or just, you know, inhomogeneities generated from that phase transition. And so the first order phase transition, for example, could produce gravitational waves on the scale of the horizon at the time of the QCD phase transition. One of the things that um, we hope to do in astronomy in the coming decades is build LISA, the space interferometer, so a space-based counterpart to the LIGO experiment. And it could potentially detect the signature of gravitational waves generated at the QCD phase transition, if it is indeed first order. All right, thanks so much. And we also have a thanks in the chat for that question. Uh, so we're going to try to close things out with uh, the uh, past president of NSBP, uh, Dr. Willie Rockward. But we're gonna... who, who I admire in many ways, but but definitely for his hairstyle. <laughs> we're gonna. I'm always jealous. We're gonna <laughs> try to. Uh, Right now, we're working on trying to get him uh, elevated as a panelist so he can actually speak. Stephen or our Zoom facilitator, are either of you able to help us out with this? I'm sorry, what was that again? Yeah, could you uh, elevate um, uh, Willie Rockward to uh, a panelist so he can sure. uh, close us out? Sure. There he is. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. David Spurgle for that uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, talk and course always. <laughs> Other than engaging questions and answers. Um, we really appreciate your, your support and your presence always at the, at the um, conference. 
and not just the conference, just throughout the entire year. Um, we, we appreciate you in so many ways, especially allowing the um, Simon and SVP scholars as they grow in their own younger, in their own careers, especially in, in um, very exciting areas of physics. Um, so again, thank you very much. Um, and I just need to give some program uh, announcements. Well, before I go into that, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say any closing remarks you'd like to say to us, Ms. Virgo. Just uh, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, and uh, you know, engaging in this discussion of the physics we're doing. And uh, you know, in my hat as a physicist, um, look forward to be you know to many conversations with many of you about, of you about different topics in physics. In my hat as Simon's Foundation president, you know, look forward to continuing to work with and uh, support NSBP in uh, all the terrific things it does. So uh, thank you all. We appreciate that. Okay, just a few uh, program announcements. If I can get position in my, and getting the proper lighting distribution, how's that? Um, we're still working with this command, um, our conference command station. Um, just wanted to share with you, uh, of course, um, a few things. And again, thank you all for your your patience as we got started, or uh, slightly slightly late, but nevertheless we got started. Um, especially from yesterday in our pre pre conference events, we appreciate everyone who attended. Um, exhibit halls are open. Just uh, be mindful that the uh, exhibit halls will be open throughout the entire day. Just that the most of the exhibitors will be will be in position. Uh, at the scheduled times on the agenda, or also uh, there, some, exhibit, some exhibitors have posted some special time that they would be available to. Um, again, we preparing after, after this luncheon session, we're preparing to go into our um, first major round of technical talks. Um, we ask that everyone be prepared accordingly and um, that the um, the session chairs are in position to um, for the different speakers. Many of many of the speakers may have you may have received your information you know, a little uh, late. Um, we, we ask that you would be mindful and, and also be very um, flexible uh, in that area, uh, as your session chair would um, have, have have positioned you to give a talk in the time range of 2.15 to 3.45. Uh, usually we are able to give you the details of what exactly slot you will be um, speaking in. Um, we were delayed this year and we ask that you would um, be patient with us and, and, and work through it, but you will be giving your talk in this specific time slot, somewhere between 2.15 and 3.45 and likewise throughout the schedule. Uh, then after after the um, this technical talk, we have we have a new a very new area in which we're doing for this year, uh, which is our big science hour. Uh, it's a great idea that the program committee have come up with, uh, where we where we where we presenting um, big scientific uh, projects that are going on with our sponsors. Um, or just in the area, in the field, in the physics uh, arena. Um, what's coming up this, today is the um, DOE, uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory, the Electron Ion Collider, uh, EIC. Uh, we have you know, uh, a great hour of hosts to share more about that and opportunities on how you can, uh, many of our researchers and, and uh, participants can be engaged and also, um, take advantage of these opportunities to be a part of the EIC um, as, as that project develops. Uh, then likewise, uh, after the big science hour, we have some time for the Q&A and the question and answers associated with it. And then um, we have some special chat time um, for uh, the future for HBCU chairs and, and just those at HBCUs, uh, faculty at HBCUs, uh, the future of physics. We have a couple of um, um, sessions for that. One today from 5.30 to 6.30, and then 
We have another special seminar with Dr. Tracy uh, uh, Slater. Uh, and then we ask that you all prepare to be at that. And then we also have our first uh, survey session. You see the survey sessions uh, is, is for the conference survey. Um, um, and Dr. Darnell Cole and the University of Southern California evaluation team will be um, doing will be doing the surveys, and we ask that you all would you know stop in. Everyone, uh, faculty, professionals, students would stop in and um, do it in small. We'll be doing it in small group sessions. So we have uh, the surveys for today. Uh, they have one session for the faculty and professionals, and then they also have another session for students. Uh, after that, we will be going to exhibit. The exhibit halls will be wide open today from 5.30 to 8 also, but we get a lot of engagement. We have a lot of opportunities for many of the students and, and our early early career faculty and, 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 and um, participants. We act that you would really, really be involved in that. But last but not least, use this. We do this on the front end of, 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 of the, of the um, session. But this time we, we, we figured we'd save the best for last. We want to acknowledge our our acknowledge our sponsors, um, our sponsors, and um, I'll, I'll please if you allow me to share my screen. Share my screen. Our conference sponsors for to, for this year is. Hoping that everyone can see this nice and clear. Oh, no, no, turn it the wrong way, hitting the wrong button. So please bear with me here. Conference sponsor, our, our, our conference partners, um, or co partners as we call them, is uh, Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, this year, they were also the ones last year, and also Associated Universities. Uh, we call them AUI for short. They are also our conference sponsor, um, co-sponsors this year. They, um, they are really major, major sponsors, even though we appreciate all of our sponsors. Uh, these two have been um, helping with a lot of the programming and organization of the conference too. Um, our goal sponsors for this year is a Corning, uh, Corning Incorporated, um, the National Radio Observatory, Astronomy Observatory, NRAO, and also NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, they are our gold sponsors for this year, and we really appreciate their support uh, likewise. Uh, and just a little side note, um, for next year's conference, uh, NRAO will be our one of our uh, co-sponsors. They will be one of our co-hosts for next year's um, conference. And then our silver sponsors uh, is Optica, formerly known as OSA, Observable Society of America. They have a name change, and now they're considered as Optica. So they are our silver sponsor. And then uh, likewise, our bronze sponsors for this year uh, was uh, FRIP, or the Facility for Rare Isotope, um, isotope Beams, beams uh, at, located at Michigan State. Uh, then uh, that more, a wonderful HBCU, Morgan State University, and then also the University of Notre Dame uh, are our key uh, bronze sponsors. And we have a host, a host, I think 50 plus uh, exhibitors uh, that are in the, the three exhibit rooms, and we ask that you would visit them um, extensively. Uh, many, many opportunities are, are being, are, are, have been prepared and will be presented throughout this entire conference. And we ask that all of our students and participants will engage with our, um, with our, with the various uh, exhibitors, uh, including all of our sponsors too. So we are ever so um, appreciative of those who have shown their uh, support of this conference in, in, in a very, very tangible way. And last but not least, we just wanna pause for a moment, uh, oh, I'm still sharing my screen. So I'm sharing. Uh, we want to pause for a moment, um, uh, as we usually do in the beginning of our of our conference. Just a moment of silence for our deceased 
um, members, um, um, for those who are aware, uh, this year, um, Dr. Aziza Bakuch uh, and uh, a few other of our of our uh, uh, longstanding uh, members have have passed away, and we just want to pause just for a moment of silence. Let's have a wonderful time. We had a great talk from Dr. Uh, David Spurgle. We've had, we have always had some engaging pre-conference uh, sessions and uh, we're looking forward to continue on this conference uh, in an exciting way. If you have any questions, comments, please feel free to share with us uh, immediately. And um, as we continue to uh, maneuver through our virtual realm uh, in this conference, in, in this conference arena. But then also, let's just keep in mind that we're looking forward to next year's conference. And we'll share with more details about that as we continue on. But now, let's enjoy this year's conference and participate to the best of our, uh, best of your ability. Again, thank you for being here and let's have a great conference. Goodbye. This ends our session for today, our, our session now.